Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions. And I'd also like to take a few yoga classes, if I can. OK. Well, we have three swimming pools, an Olympic-size 50-metre pool and a 25-metre pool, uh, which are both outdoors, and a heated indoor pool, which is just 15 metres long, uh, but is very popular with our members in the winter. <laughs> I bet it is. Do members have to pay to use the pools? Well, members don't pay for the pools if they just want to swim laps on their own. We even offer complimentary classes for beginners, but we do charge a small fee if you want to take part in the advanced training sessions. And there's also a fee for our water-based Keep Fit class. Right. And would I need to book any of the facilities, or can I just come whenever I want? We don't actually allow anyone to book the swimming lanes or the gym equipment, but for safety reasons, we can only have a maximum of seven people in the sauna at any one time. So you do need to put your name on the list for that. Fine. Now you have some time to look at questions. Now, I'd also really like to take a yoga class. Do you have any? Yes, there are classes on Monday, Tuesday and Friday in the morning from 10 till 11. And then every Saturday and Sunday in the evening. Those classes are a bit longer, starting at 6 and finishing at 7.30. Right, I'll just make a note of that. So, does that mean that if I enrol, I can come on each of those days? No, each day is a different level, so you only come once a week. Oh, I see. Well, I've been doing yoga for a little while now, but I am still finding it quite difficult. Which level do you think I should choose? Most people start at the lowest level, and then you can talk to the instructor about changing if you think it's too easy. OK. How much are the classes? They're £1.50 an hour for members. Great. Now, I'd like to come in and look at the facilities. Would someone be able to show me around? Yes, no problem. Who should I ask for? Ask for me. My name is John Doherty. That's D-O-H-E-R-T-Y. And should I just ask for you at the reception? Actually, my office is on a different level. Take the lift up to level one and you'll see my name on the door right in front of you. Great. Um, I'd like to come tomorrow, if that's OK. What time suits you? Well, I have appointments from 9 to 10.30, so could you make it 11? I'm sure that will be fine. But can I just take your direct number in case something else crops up? <laughs> that's a good idea. My number's 0117. Nine six five four seven eight. Great. I think that's everything, so I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, my name's Alison Martin, by the way. Thanks, Alison. See you tomorrow. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear from the manager of the Castle Hotel.
She is addressing the guests about the Food Lovers Weekend. First you will get some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone and welcome to Ireland. It's great to see so many of you here today and I'm delighted that you have decided to join us here at the Castle Hotel for our special Food Lovers Weekend. Before I tell you about the main events we have planned for you, I'd just like to point out that tea and coffee and biscuits are available at the back of the room, so please help yourselves. So, the weekend's events start straight after lunch, which you can take either in the main restaurant to my right or in the garden terrace, which you'll find to the right of the main reception desk. This afternoon we are very excited to welcome local chef Laura Gallagher to the Castle Hotel. Laura will be showing you some typically Irish ingredients, many from her own garden, and explaining how good food needn't cost a fortune. She's also going to demonstrate a few famous Irish dishes, including Irish stew. As you may know, Laura runs her own award-winning organic restaurant about 10 miles from here, and I know a few of you are planning to eat there tomorrow night. I can highly recommend it. So those of you who have booked for this afternoon's session should gather in the demonstration kitchen, which is to the left of the main restaurant, by 1.45pm, so that we can get going promptly at 2pm. And I'm sorry, a few people have already asked me, but this session is now full. However, there are still places on the city bus tour which will be leaving the hotel at 1.45. This will take you to all the main sites and there will be a chance to stop off at the Riverside Museum and Cafe later in the afternoon. The coach will return from the museum at 5pm promptly. Please note that entrance to the museum is not included, so you will have to pay on the door. But we do have a special discount, so that will be €8.50, Euros 50, rather than the usual €11.75. Euros 75. Tonight we have our five-course seafood dinner in the main restaurant. Our head chef has really planned a treat for you. I've seen the menu and it looks fantastic. Please note that this is not at 7.30 as originally stated in your holiday itinerary, but at 8 p.m. There is a seating plan up in the main reception, so please check this before this evening so you know where you're seated. Oh, and one other thing regarding food. I've already had a couple of special requests from allergy sufferers, so please do let me know as soon as possible if you have any special dietary requirements. After dinner, starting around 10pm, if you still have the energy, we have Irish folk singer James Corgan here to entertain you until the wee small hours. His family have been making Irish music for over 200 years and he will treat you to both traditional and modern folk songs. He plays no fewer than six different instruments including the baran, a traditional drum, the tin whistle and the Irish fiddle. Well worth staying up for. Before you hear the rest of the speech, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Tomorrow will be an early start for most of you who have booked on our culinary tour of the region. The restaurant will be open for an early breakfast from 6.30am and the coach will be leaving at 7.45am. We have a packed itinerary and our first stop is at Mill Farm where they still use traditional methods to make butter, cheese and other dairy products. You will have a chance to try your hand at churning the butter and shaping it using traditional butter beaters. 
Our next stop is the world famous oyster cafe, where you can sample fresh oysters and other shellfish. I'm hoping the weather stays fine for this, as it's such a beautiful setting next to the harbour wall, and you may be able to see some of the fishing boats coming in with their catch. That will just be a brief stop, as the highlight of the morning will be our stop at the famous Mount Reese Baking School, where Chef Jonathan Park will be showing you how to make Irish bread and giving you some other baking tips. I'm told that Jonathan has a few surprises up his sleeve, and I know that he's keen on audience participation, so be prepared to get your aprons on and hands dirty for that one. Our lunch stop will be the Waterside Restaurant. It's a beautiful lakeside setting, and if the weather's fine, you'll be able to walk around the lake after your meal. Although lunch isn't included in the trip, the restaurant is offering you the special price of a two course meal at only 25 euros per person. Our route home takes us through some amazing mountainous landscape, and there will be chances to stop and take photographs before our final stop at the Wakeford Food Centre, which is a true retail paradise for food lovers. They sell all sorts of exotic and local ingredients, and there are always plenty of tasting opportunities. Be prepared to part company with some of your euros. We aim to arrive at the centre in time for afternoon tea, if you can manage any after your lunch. Our return to the hotel will hopefully be by 6:30 p.m., and there will be a chance to relax for a while before dinner at 8 p.m. And so to Monday. Well, the trip to the local farmers market still has a number of free places, so please let me know if you're interested. The price for transport there and back is five euros, but of course you'll need to take along plenty of cash for all your purchases. Unfortunately, we have had to cancel the talk from cookery writer Mariah Kelly as she is unwell. But instead, for those of you who are having the cookery demonstration this afternoon, we are offering you a chance to visit the Riverside Museum, or you may just decide to spend Monday morning relaxing and enjoying the grounds here at the Castle Hotel. Lunch will be at twelve thirty, and then the coach to take you to the airport will leave here at two thirty. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students giving the results of a survey they conducted. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Right now, it's time for Sylvie and Daniel to give us the results of their survey into the study skills course that some of you did last term. Thanks, Mr. Driver. Um, shall I start, Daniel? Sure, go ahead. Okay.、Uh, well, as you know, some students in our year did the study skills course run by the English department last term. Um, it was interesting because it was completely voluntary. It wasn't a compulsory component of the exam course or anything that we need in that way, but Mr. Driver thought it would be a good idea, that it would help with our other work. Yeah, so after the course finished, Daniel and I decided to review it, ask students what they thought about it, as part of our education assignment. Yeah. So, this is how we did it,、uh, our study method. At first, we thought about interviewing students face to face. But we have so much other work, and we knew it'd be quicker to use email and just send out a questionnaire. Though we also had to write that. Yes, and this method does rely on students filling it in and sending it back. But the response rate was pretty good. Yeah, seventy percent, I think. Okay, so first of all, thirty-three students signed up for the course. 
and we did twelve sessions over the term, and they took place every Monday morning. A good start to the week, I thought. Yeah, and the rest of the week we could put things into practice. Hmm. So, what did we expect? For me, I expected it to be useful for all my subjects, things like philosophy. Yeah, that's what Mr. Driver had said. And I was right. I feel more able to deal with difficult texts now, you know, like the ones we have in economics. You feel you can do it. Yeah, I think other people found that it actually made them want to read more frequently, and read books outside the course list. If you've got time, um, as for our teacher on the course, Jenny, everyone felt she was really good. We learned a lot from her, not because she said a lot of homework or anything like that. The thing people said was that she gave us fascinating articles and ideas to work with. Some of them, well. We were quite happy to carry on looking at them at home. Yeah, that's so important. It's really easy to get bored in class, but that didn't happen. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Okay, so we've done a couple of charts.、Uh, let's have a look at the findings. I'll put up the first chart. This is your overall view of the usefulness of the course. And as you can see, only a small percentage of students didn't feel it was useful. Which is good. Yeah, everyone else had a positive view of the course, and more than half of us—that's about sixty percent—thought it was very useful. Which. Well, as this is the first time the course has been run, I guess this is a strong recommendation for it to take place again next year. The next chart shows how useful you felt each part of the course was. So, just to remind you, there was the speed reading component that came out top. No surprise there, really.、Mm. On the other hand, giving talks was. Well, we all like talking, but it's not something we have to do that often. Yeah, so that was the least useful. Then the note-taking component you found to be quite useful, and you had a lot of comments about that. Okay, so let's have a look at some of your comments. You said a lot about the activities, but the main comment seemed to be that the techniques we learned on the note-taking course helped us focus more in lectures. Several people said that they daydream much less. Yeah, have a longer attention span. So that's the first benefit. The second is that students said they really appreciated the instruction on when to use a diagram to take notes. Hmm. Like many people, I'd never thought of this technique, but now I find it really helpful. And it's much more fun. Yeah. And then the last comment we wanted to mention was about the type of paper that we used in the note-taking sessions. It seems obvious now that a wide margin down the side of the paper provides another area where you can add points that you've missed, and that makes it a lot easier to read the notes afterwards. Okay, so now we'll look at the results. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture from a professor of mathematics. He is talking about the mathematical letter pi. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Today, in the first in the series of talks about significant numbers, I'm going to talk about pi. As a mathematician and engineer, I find many numbers fascinating, but for me, pi is probably the most interesting. So, what is pi? Well, as all of you will probably know, pi is what you get if you divide the circumference of a circle, that's the distance around the outside edge, by its diameter, that's a straight line through its centre. And as most of you will also have learnt in your maths lessons at school, that number is usually calculated to two decimal places, and is commonly recognised as 3.14. But what you might not know is that this number is infinitely long. That is, if you keep on dividing the circumference by the diameter, you get a never-ending number. Pi is sometimes represented as the fraction 22 over 7, which only gives us an approximation of the ratio. This figure has given us in Europe Pi Approximation Day, which is celebrated on the 22nd day of the 7th month, that is, July the 22nd. However, in the United States, World Pi Day is held on March the 14th, which in American date notation is written as 3 over 14, representing the first three figures of the decimal representation of Pi. Many educational institutions hold special events on these days. First, I'll talk a little about the significance of Pi. Pi has fascinated scholars, mathematicians and scientists for thousands of years, and for many, this fascination involves calculating its value with increasing precision. It has numerous practical uses. One of the reasons Pi is so well known and studied is that it can be found in so many different formulae. As its ratio relates to circles, it is essential in both trigonometry and geometry, and can also be found in dozens of formulae relating to physics, cosmology, electromagnetism, engineering, geology, probability and statistics. So, let's have a brief look at its history. Well, we have to go right back to the ancient Babylonians to see that some understanding of Pi has been around for a long time. As they were building their city, the ancient Babylonian town planners took a great interest in geometry, and as far back as the 20th century BCE, they discovered that if you divide a circle's circumference by its diameter, you always get a number in the region of 3. Their exact calculation gave this ratio a value of 3.125, which is only half a percent outside the true value of pi. We have numerous historical accounts of pi. One of the earliest dates back to the 2nd century BCE and is on an ancient Egyptian papyrus scroll. This version of pi is in fact a copy of an earlier document and, although not entirely accurate, is within 1% of its true value at 3.160. Over the years, numerous notable mathematicians and scientists have worked on defining the value of pi. The famous Greek scholar Archimedes, working in the 1st century BCE, took a theoretical approach to the study of pi. He devised a system for working out the value of pi using polygons, that is a flat shape with at least three sides or angles. This is why it is sometimes called Archimedes constant. After Archimedes, mathematicians, scientists and astronomers from India, Persia and China attempted to calculate the pi ratio, but it wasn't until the 16th and 17th centuries that the development of infinite series techniques allowed far more precise calculations. It was early the following century that a little-known Welsh mathematician by the name of William Jones, a contemporary and friend of Sir Isaac Newton, actually gave the ratio a name, suggesting pi, after the 16th letter of the Greek alphabet. The 18th and 19th centuries saw two significant breakthroughs for pi. The first was in 1761, when the Swiss mathematician Johann Lambert established that pi is an irrational number. This means that it cannot be expressed as a fraction of two whole numbers. The second breakthrough occurred in 1882, when Ferdinand von Lindemann, a mathematician from Germany, 
demonstrated that pi was transcendental. This means that it is not possible to find a square with an exactly equal area to a given circle. It was another German mathematician, Ludolf van Keulen, who, back at the beginning of the 17th century, calculated pi to 35 decimal places. This achievement really set the ball rolling for the sometimes obsessive quest by mathematicians the world over to find the highest number of digits when calculating pi. Some have devoted years of their lives to this cause, with varying degrees of success. William Shanks, who was not even a professional mathematician, spent around 20 years to calculate pi to 707 decimal places. His achievement was discredited after his death when it was discovered that he had made a mistake and only the first 527 digits were correct. This error was discovered in 1944 using one of the first digital calculators and the computer era revolutionized mathematicians' ability to find ever-increasing numbers of digits. Throughout the mid-20th century, the record for the number of digits was broken repeatedly until 1973, when over one million digits was reached. Since then, the record has gone on to be broken a number of times, many of which used multi-million pound computers. The record is now around 10 trillion digits, that's 10 followed by 12 noughts. One of the most notable achievements was by a Frenchman called Fabrice Bellard, who in 2009 developed a new formula to calculate pi, which has subsequently become known as Bellard's formula. This enabled him to calculate pi to 2,700 billion decimal places. What made his achievement so amazing was that the software programmer used his 2,000 pound desktop computer, taking 131 days to complete the calculation. His record has since been broken a number of times. Finally, one other notable achievement that might interest you was by a research student, Lu Chao, who in 2005 memorized and recited Pi to 67,000 890 digits without making a single mistake. The feat took the postgraduate just over 24 hours to complete. So, as you can see, pi is a fascinating number. Moving on now, let's talk a little more about pi's relevance to everyday life. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.